Greetings, my name is Dan and welcome to Logic. In this video, I would like to address a burning question in many people's minds, which is how did ancient people move large blocks of stone with just manpower, wood and rope? Well, in this video, I would like to help visualize how this was achieved by people from hundreds to thousands of years ago using various examples, experiments and sources. There are so many buildings and monuments around the world that are made of multi-ton blocks of stone, some colossal stones weighing from hundreds of tons to a few that even weigh close to a thousand tons. These ancient structures are dated and attributed to cultures from hundreds to thousands of years ago. So first, I will outline a few examples of these huge stones from various cultures and examples that are often referenced. If you're very familiar with this topic, then feel free to skip ahead to this timestamp as this is where the video examples begin. The earliest examples that we are currently uncovering of megalithic stoneworking is from various sites in Turkey, most famously Gobekli Tepe of course, which is dated to around 11,600 years ago, with some of the largest T-pillars weighing between 8 and 10 tonnes. I've even read some estimated up to 14 tonnes. Now, whilst these are genuine megalithic monuments for the time and would have needed a good number of coordinated people to move in place, they pale in comparison to the monuments and buildings that would come thousands of years later from the likes of the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Mayans, Incas and many other cultures. Ancient Egypt is probably the most referenced culture when it comes to the topic of how ancient cultures moved extremely large stones as they constructed many statues and obelisks that can weigh up to hundreds of tons. However, even though the Romans quarried and moved some of the largest blocks in human history, the ancient Egyptians still appear more enigmatic to us today as we don't have extensive records about their construction methods like we do with the Romans. So how did they move these gigantic blocks? And how did they raise obelisks? It is commonly thought amongst archaeologists and historians that they utilised boats or barges mostly, but for transporting on land they would use large wooden sleds to mount the stone on, then pulled them along using dozens or hundreds or potentially thousands of people depending on the size of what was being transported. I do wonder if they also used animals sometimes. Many of their techniques and equipment has either been lost to time or repurposed for other cultures. After all, the ancient Egyptian dynasties lasted around 3,000 years and their pre-dynastic history stretches back even farther. As mentioned earlier, the Romans used some of the largest blocks of stone ever quarried, notably the Trilithon stones at Baalbek at the Temple of Jupiter, which weigh an estimated 800 tonnes. And there are other large blocks which were seemed like they were going to be used for the complex, but were never moved from their quarries and weigh over a thousand tonnes most famously the stone of the pregnant woman. There are Roman documents, writings and art depicting how they built with large stones, most famously for example De Architectura by Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, dedicated to the Emperor Caesar Augustus, which was a guide for building projects. We found a number of depictions of the Romans using pulley systems with cranes and winches, and they may have used multiple cranes simultaneously for extremely large stones. This is what a typical Roman treadwheel crane looked like, and they probably had different sizes and designs for different purposes, just like we do with our modern cranes. Here also are some discovered Roman wooden winches, and here is a modern reconstruction of a treadwheel crane. Here are some real life uses and experiments with these treadwheel cranes. So these machines are absolutely necessary in the construction process. We couldn't build the castle at the rate we are without them. We hoist somewhere in the region of three metric tons every day. There we go. Okay. Okay. And stop. We also know that the Romans moved at least 15 Egyptian obelisks to Rome, so we know the Romans had the capability of transporting multi-hundred ton blocks over great distances, from land to their ships, over the Mediterranean Sea to their destination. 
I'm planning on making a video about all the obelisks that were moved from Egypt to different places around the world over time, so I'll leave the gritty details to that video. Now on to more examples and experiments. As part of a Nova documentary at a granite quarry in Massachusetts about a decade ago, an American sculptor named Rick Brown had a granite obelisk cut and tried an old method of raising an obelisk by pulling it over a ramp edge into sand, where the sand would be gradually removed, letting the obelisk lower slowly where it would be more safely pulled to its final standing position. I'll let the awesome footage speak for itself. It's big and it's massive, but it's using very simple forces, simply the force of flowing sand. To ensure that it drops down precisely into the turning groove, the obelisk is guided by steps built into the back wall. In addition, brake ropes held back by massive logs are released slowly to exert maximum control as the obelisk sinks towards the turning groove. The obelisk has hit its target, and the walls of the sandbox have now been removed. You can see we have the obelisk in the turning groove. It's at 75 degrees. Most of the hard work's done. But what remaining is a task that is, uh, could be daunting, and that is we have to uh, now pull the obelisk that last 15 degrees into the 90 degree position. Gently, gently. We have touchdown! We have a freestanding obelisk! Rick Brown's apparently simple method took advantage of gravity and the natural properties of sand. You know, the Egyptians were, were learning through keen observation, looking carefully at all the details. They learned how these materials behaved. And, and once they understood that, they used those forces of nature to be able to do something as magnificent as this. This method was even depicted in the famous 1956 movie, The Ten Commandments. That drop puts too much strain on the stone. We need more sand. I'm going to risk it, Baka. There's little time till the day of Jubilee. If the stone cracks, you may crack with it. We'll burn it! Ready. Green pennant. Ballot men, ready! Ballot men, ready! Green lines, stand by! Stand the main hawser! Ballot men, ready? Red pennant. There are 2,000 slaves on the ropes. Although it was dramatized more for the film, it's still amazingly done for 1956. In the movie, they also depict many hundreds, possibly thousands of people pulling a great statue on wooden sleds, like was depicted in the tomb of Jehutihotep. And remember, this film is over two thirds of a century old at this point. A huge relevant example is Mussolini's column, which was moved in 1929. It is a shaft of marble around 60 foot long and weighs around 250 tons. It was enclosed with a wooden casket for transport, which would have added quite a few more tons to the total weight. It was pulled and pushed with the aid of wooden rollers by just people for about half the journey to the river. People would pick up and lay wood in front of the statue to be moved over, and they even managed to navigate it through this tight tunnel, which is pretty awesome. They then used 80 oxen to transport it a further 9 miles to the river where a special barge was waiting to transport it the rest of the journey to Rome. 
Someone to also note was Edward Leeds Skalnin, who built the famous Coral Castle on his own from around 1930 to 1950. He was a master at stonework, and although people for years wondered how he could have constructed Coral Castle on his own, old footage was eventually uncovered showing that he used simple cranes, winches and pretty basic techniques. He had such a great understanding of stone that he crafted numerous works taking advantage of balance and the centre of gravity, like these stone rocking chairs. Here's further example of how he's balanced these great carvings. There's comfort in these rockers too. There was a BBC movie made around 1996 in which an experiment was conducted where a hundred people attempted to pull a 45-ton stone for 18 miles using wooden guide rails lubricated with animal fat. And as you can see, they achieved quite an impressive speed. I'm having trouble tracking down this movie exactly, so if anyone knows what the name of this movie was, please let me know in the comments so I can try and get a full copy. Wally Wallington is also worth mentioning as he has demonstrated moving multi-ton blocks of stone on his own using simple counterweights and leverage techniques. He's even moved a barn successfully on his own, and is also famous for creating his own Stonehenge. Then I add the weight to that end, there she goes, and slide the board in on this end. This shoring box acts like a jack, slowly raising the block. It's three feet off the ground, but tomorrow is the big experiment. Standing it up. Ready? Yes! All right. Now just start spraying the sand. The sand will wash out and the block will start coming down. Once the sand is washed from the pit, the block's own weight slowly stands it up. Okay, finally, she's between the lines, guys. Looks good. He did it. There's also this footage of people pulling a 10-ton stone uphill as an experiment. Also, there are many stone pulling ceremonies that happen yearly around the world. But as their ceremonies, the whole community usually pulls one large stone together, which in some places has been a tradition for well over 100 years. There are also the Easter Island Moai statue experiments that show how these statues could have been walked over land using just people and ropes. I would also like to give a quick shout out to Scientists Against Myths for an explanation on how even the sarcophagi in the Serapium of Saqqara could have been moved into place easily and is the most feasible idea I've seen so far. I'll play a little clip here, but please go and watch the full video. I'll put a link in the description. The sarcophagus would then turn an inch into the chamber. The workers pulling the ropes were positioned in the corridor. The chamber would be covered with sand up to the floor level, so that once inside, the sarcophagus would be at the same level as the corridor. Then the workers would shovel the sand out of the chamber, thus slowly lowering the sarcophagus onto the floor. The sarcophagi being placed below the level of the central gallery is a big plus. You didn't have to lift the lid to put it on top of the sarcophagus, as the lid rested on the sarcophagus right at the gallery floor level. Now here are some examples of how we can move entire buildings. In 1930, the Indiana Bell Telephone Exchange central office was moved and rotated. It weighed approximately 11,000 tons. And amazingly, it was moved with no service outages because of all the utility pipes being lengthened and made flexible for the move. So they still had gas, water and electricity. So telephone service went on without interruption and employees reported they never even felt the building move. In 1987, in Romania, under the communist regime of Nicolae Ceausescu, they were planning a boulevard in the city of Alba Lulia, but a 7,600-ton apartment building was in the way, so it was ordered to be moved. Engineers decided to split the building in half, and with all the residents still inside, they dug under the building to jack it up and move the entire building out of the way on rails, each half weighing around 3,800 tons, which they did with all the residents still inside, furniture and all. It's even reported that a woman decided to place a glass of water on the edge of her balcony and it didn't spill a drop. 
Two years before that, in 1985, the Fairmount Hotel in San Antonio was the first building to be moved on wheels. It weighed approximately 1,600 tonnes and was moved half a mile over a four-day period. Had to make two road turns and cross a bridge on its journey. At 3.02 Saturday afternoon, the 79-year-old hotel rolls no more than a foot or so. A small dent in the project, but enough to delight onlookers. And as the Fairmont made its way onto Commerce Street, there was praise for the people involved in saving a part of San Antonio's past. How do you turn a three million pound, three story brick building? Obviously very slowly, very gently, and with precise maneuvering of the dollies which support the building. Now in the 21st century, we can move crazy amounts when we want to with today's technology and engineers. Just check out some of these buildings we've moved. The record so far being the Fu Gang building in China, which weighed around 15,000 tonnes. Unfortunately, I could only find this one piece of footage, which is really low quality. Moving a building weighing over 12,000 tons is about as hard as it sounds. Never before had such a structure of this size been moved in Shanghai. The columns are capable of supporting 400 tons. The big challenge will be to move them and reinforce them properly so they can support the building after the move. 12 lifting jacks are placed on the eastern side of the building, while 16 are on the southern side. Each is capable of lifting 200 tons. The project will last 20 days. The foundations will be reinforced to ensure it stands the test of time for many more decades to come. But also check out this footage of Lagina Primary School in Shanghai, which weighs around 7,600 tons. And because of its non-uniform shape, it had to be moved and rotated with new technology developed for this task, which literally walks the building. Simply amazing. Overall, there is an abundant amount of experiments and actual events which show that with human ingenuity and engineering, we can move huge amounts of weight. And because the majority of blocks of ancient buildings were quarried either on site or nearby, ancient cultures didn't even have to move most of the stones that far. So what do you think? Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. I hope you have a great day and stay safe out there.